listening to the Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. Asia Times reports why Netanyahu is ignoring Biden's calls and pleas. Israeli and U.S. leaders guided by divergent domestic needs while speculation mounts. Israel may get a better deal under a Trump presidency. For insight into this, we turn to our next guest. He holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book is entitled Revolting Capital, Racism and Radicalism in Washington, D.C., 1900 to 2000. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. So the piece opens as follows. The U.S. and Israel are at odds over how the Gaza war should be conducted and what should ultimately define a victory over Hamas, a reflection of the two allies and their respective leaders' divergent short-term needs and longer-term goals. Dr. Horn, I think the premise of this piece is incredibly flawed. Biden's rhetoric might lead one to believe, might, might, need, might lead one to believe this, but even within his own statements, there are contradictions, and the U.S. continues to send the settler colony funding, weapons, and other supplies. So this leads me to a different conclusion. And also, Biden's statement, I am a Zionist, is a tip-off. And then they talk about a better deal under Trump as though U.S. policies significantly changes depending upon the administration. I don't think history tells us that that's true. Dr. Gerald Horn. Well, I think that that's a fair assessment, but I would raise a a few points in response. One is that there are contradictions within the policies of the U.S. administration. And just as one oftentimes invests in a stock, not necessarily because of its return on investment today, but what it might produce in a year or two. Likewise, we have to look over the horizon and around the corner and try to tease out where the policy of the U.S. ruling class is going. To that end, I would point you to an article in today's Washington Post by that de facto stenographer for the Central Intelligence Agency, speaking speaking of David Ignatius, who is just back from a trip to that region, and he suggests that U.S. imperialism may have to knock some heads together in Israel, which is rather startling. And not only from Mr. Ignatius, who, as you know, oftentimes reflects the dominant line in Washington, but also for what that might portend in terms of conflict with the Israeli lobby, which shows no sign of losing steam. I would also point out in this context that there are clear divergences between the two settler colonial projects, speaking of the one in North America and the one in historic Palestine. The United States has larger stakes at play, larger fish to fry, not least in Ukraine, particularly with regard to the People's Republic of China, whereas Israel, a regional power at best, is now, quite frankly, of fighting a battle for survival. And we could not have necessarily envisioned this on October 6th, but it's not foreordained that Israel will win that battle for survival, which I think is leading to its rather hysterical policies that are drawing rebukes and reprimands from all over the world, but not enough thus far to shake the support of the U.S. administration, which has to bend the knee to a degree to the Israeli lobby. But it also has to bend the knee to the major U.S. corporations. And if you look at the stock of Starbucks, for example, uh, which makes a goodly a good number of its profits abroad, its stock is going down. As a matter of fact, uh, here's an investment tip. You should short Starbucks <laughs> if you can get in on that uh, profit graph because many of its shops in West Asia are sitting empty. Ditto with regard to McDonald's. You probably saw the video of a pro-Palestinian protester in Istanbul uh, releasing mice 
in a McDonald's shop. This is in response to that story that said that McDonald's in Israel was giving out free Happy Meals to Israeli soldiers, which have now turned into unhappy meals as far as uh, McDonald's stockholders are concerned. And then there is the uncertain response of the so-called Arab street from Morocco and North Africa to Bahrain, where the United States has a a major military uh, fortress. Uh, That is to say that despite their seeking to snuggle up to Israel with regard to the ill-fated Abraham Accords, their populists do not agree. U.S. imperialism now has to fret and worry that their embrace, their bear hug of Israel and Netanyahu may lead to the toppling of these regimes. And then of late, there is the story that we have been following concerning the uh, Suez Canal and the attacks from Yemen uh, on shipping, which has caused many of the shipping giants, who, as you know, in recent decades, in order to foil the National Maritime Union, which at one time in the United States was led by communists of Jamaican origin, such as Ferdinand Smith, then they adopted these flags of convenience. They now fly under the Liberian flag, for example. But now, despite being so-called Liberian ships, they want the U.S. Navy to organize convoys, even though they're not paying taxes to the taxpayers. And apparently, the U.S. Navy is going to comply, uh, which is one more blow at the U.S. taxpayer. And by the way, I would urge our friends in Egypt, uh, who have a a certain kind of supervision of the the Suez Canal, to uh, seek urgent consultation with our friends in Panama, who command that choke point, the Panama Canal, because I think that they could uh, basically ally and charge a pretty penny against these shipping giants who are using these two choke points. And then the United States and the Biden administration have to be concerned about the uh, Arab American vote, particularly in Michigan, and what that may portend for his electoral chances. And, of course, uh, the aforementioned Zionist lobby is pledging to knock off the black members of, the con- con- of Congress, speaking of uh, Corey Bush of St. Louis, uh, Andre Carson of Indiana, a Muslim, uh, Summer Lee of Western Pennsylvania, Jamal Bowman of Bronx Westchester, because they have made the simple demand that there be a ceasefire. Uh, what that will mean for a possible democratic control or lack thereof of the House is uncertain, but certainly it does not bode well. And I should have mentioned in that litany of Congresswoman Ilhan Omar of Minnesota. Reference here the story in the Associated Press suggesting that uh, Black Americans are engaging in more sympathetic solidarity with Palestinians. That's going to introduce more rifts in the Democratic Party base between these Black Americans and the Zionist lobby. And then, of course, uh, hovering above all else is the fact that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, may be in the process of fraying, not only because of the possible return to the White House of the uh, orange man himself, speaking of Mr. Trump, uh, but in his uh, plans or his suggestion that he will pull the United States out of NATO. But the Western European nations have to be concerned that this U.S. bond with Israel is jeopardizing capitalist interests overall, not least in the so-called global south, the global majority, that is to say, which flexed its muscles in the General Assembly a few days ago when it voted overwhelmingly for a ceasefire. So the White House has a lot of issues on its plate. I'm not sure if they have the bandwidth or the intelligence or the moxie to deal with all of these issues. And that does not necessarily bode well for the 46 U.S. president. Um, it's, uh, Asia Times, China's choices on Gaza and Ukraine. And what's interesting is when you get to the end of this article, they say Israel has to find a way to integrate more and better with the rest of the Middle East. It has to stop being a European outpost. It has to bridge to Europe, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Dave must have wrote this article a while back because it looks to me like a number of the things that they're proposing right now, there is little of any chance of that happening. At any rate, your thoughts, Dr. Horn? Well, that's the understatement of the decade. I mean, uh, let's face it. uh, Israel styles itself as a European outpost. That's why 
it's affiliated in sports, such as in basketball, not with his neighbors, but with the Europeans. That's why it participates in these cultural extravaganzas, like the so-called Eurovision concerts that take place on an annual basis. And so that is the story with regard to Israel. But with regard to China, I think Israel has been disappointed, to put it mildly, by the response of China to this crisis, because Israel thought it had a deal with China. After all, Israel had been accused credibly of leaking advanced U.S. military technology to the People's Republic of China. That is a reflection of the power of the Israeli lobby, which is able to squash not only dissent, but even simple press coverage of stories with this kind of explosiveness. Now, of course, China has made it clear that it stands with the Palestinians uh, to the disappointment uh, of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, China recognizes that uh, if this crisis in Palestine is not resolved in a satisfactory manner, that will give jet propulsion to the crisis U.S. imperialism would like to ignite in Taiwan, which, by the way, will have important elections in a few weeks, which will tell the tale as to what the fate of that 20 million strong island off the south coast, southern coast of China will be. And then, of course, uh, China uh, has to be concerned about the reaction in a country like Indonesia, the largest nation with a predominantly Muslim majority on planet Earth, which is also a storehouse of oil and other natural resources, also has a substantial population of Chinese descent, which is the case, by the way, in a good deal of Southeast Asia. And that population of Chinese descent has played a pivotal and instrumental role in the rise of the People's Republic of China to the giant that it is today. And so they have to be concerned, given the past pogroms against that Chinese population within the last decade or two, about what the response of Indonesia will be. Recall that just a few weeks ago, on the way to the APEC summit in San Francisco, the economic cooperation of Asian Pacific nations, that Joko Widodo, the Indonesian leader, stopped by the White House and gave a strong message in support of the Palestinians. So once again, Israel has found itself on the back foot to a certain extent outfoxed, but I'm not sure if that necessarily bodes well because the Israeli hawks have made it clear that they're willing to pull down the entire temple uh, rather than a seed to a possible Palestinian state, I think they'll be forced to do so, but we should not see that as a slam dunk or a guarantee. Uh, really quickly, Amaya Dean uh, English, the U.S. Congress silences dissent by targeting reputed academics. Really want your take on this as an academic yourself. You know, when I listen to uh, Stefanik, Congresswoman Stefanik's gibberish, a lot of it was a bunch of hypothetical rhetoric. What if? Uh, students were to call for the genocide of Israeli students or people in in Israel, while in fact the United States is backing actual genocide. Uh, your thoughts, Dr. Horn? Not only that, but lost in the press coverage is that the preface to her question was that calling for intifada or raising the slogan of Palestine from the river to the sea shall be free, mm -hmm. that that was a call for genocide <laughs> against Jewish people, which is demagogy of, of the first order. But the fundamental problem with regard to universities right now is that speech codes were developed in higher education some decades ago in order to give maximum latitude and leeway to those who would like to engage in anti-blackness. For example, the University of Pennsylvania, Put in your search engine, water buffalo, Israeli student, black sorority, Delta Sigma Theta. And you will find a controversy where the women, the black women of Delta Sigma Theta, were forced to absorb insults from an Israeli student because, of course, the speech codes were giving latitude to anti blackness. But now the worm is turned. Now the snowflake, so called, which is the term affixed to black people, you could well affix to these pro dynasties so of course that is not happening, uh, which is one more example of the hypocrisy that is driving down the U.S. stock in the international community. But I dare say that the Zionists may be overreaching 
you, you saw that in the column by Brett Stevens in the New York Times a few days ago, a basic primer on why he thinks anti-Zionism is anti-Jewishness or anti-Semitism. And he made the rather remarkable comment that only Jewish people can create, can, can, can critique <laughs> Zionism. Mm-hmm. Now, if I were to say that only black people can critique um, black nationalism, I'd probably lose my job. And that kind of hypocrisy is what's driving down the U.S. stock. And that, of course, we cannot be sad about. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Greatly, greatly appreciate that analysis, and we look forward to having you back.